Hey everyone, so today we're going to talk about movement. Um, so I'm Sebastian, uh, I'm the education chair for the Central Florida Brain Bee. I'm also a TA for human anatomy, clinical neuroanatomy, and clinical neuroscience at the University of Central Florida. Um, and I'm also a certified personal trainer, so my insight on this topic is going to be uh, a little bit different than others, and uh, hopefully you guys learn something more from me, because I apply this every single day uh, in my one of my jobs, as well as in my own personal training. So, first things first, we've got to talk about flexors, extensors, and agonists and antagonists. So, every muscle in our body uh, is innervated by some nerve, and those nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system that come from our spinal cord. Remember that our central nervous system is our brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system is everything outside of that. So, a peripheral nerve is going to innervate something, say, for example, the musculocutaneous nerve will innervate the biceps brachii, which is that, uh, the biceps that we all know and love in our arms. And those are going to help flex at the elbow. So this gets us to the concept of what a flexor is and what an extensor is. So by definition, a flexion uh, at a joint is going to be a decrease in the angle of that joint. So if you hold your arm straight out, kind of like that picture is showing, and then you were to bend your elbow so that your palm is closer to your face, that would be the action of flexion. And the biceps brachii is one of the muscles that helps you do flexion specifically at the elbow. Now we also have extensors. Um, so the triceps brachii in your arm, for example, in the posterior aspect or the back of your arm, those are going to help extend at the elbow. Now clearly, now we have two yin and yang type of muscles, right? We have the muscles that are going to flex our elbow and the muscles that are going to extend at our elbow. And this concept of agonist and antagonist is throughout the entire body. So um, the agonist of elbow flexion would be the biceps brachii, and the antagonist is going to be the triceps brachii. Now, if you were to talk about extending your elbow, then the agonist would be the triceps brachii, and the flexor muscle would be the antagonist. So they work in opposites. And every time you move your body, uh, for example, every time you move your elbow, your brain is coordinating the movement of the contraction of your biceps brachii, which therefore contributes to the relaxation of your triceps brachii. So when you are flexing your elbow, you are stretching out your tricep. And when you are extending your elbow, your triceps brachii is contracting and shortening, but your biceps brachii is now elongating. Okay, so that's the concept of agonist versus antagonist, as well as flexors and extensors. Um, the flexors of your knee are going to be your hamstrings, and then the extensors of your knee are going to be your quadriceps. And this continues down and through other joints of the body as well. But those are probably the best examples I can give you. Now, don't worry. If you're nervous, we're not going to force you guys to memorize all of the muscles of the body. And we're not going to force you guys to memorize every single nerve of the body. Um, what you guys really need to focus on is understanding the concept that a nerve is going to come out of the spinal cord and innervate the musculature, um, and those muscles are then gonna be activated to move the skeletal system, okay? So think of a bunch of pulleys acting on uh, your bones. So your bones are just there without your muscles, they would, they would basically not stand up straight, but thanks to your muscles, you have rigidity in your body, okay? Now, continuing the concept of agonists versus antagonists, um, every time you ride a bike or go up the stairs or walk to class or, you know, run when you're playing a sport, your body and your, your brain, your nervous system and your cerebellum are going to constantly be processing this information so that you flex the correct muscles and extend the correct muscles and uh, relax the right muscles and, and contract the right muscles so that you can actually produce that movement. So take the image, for example, of someone riding a bike. Um, if you are pushing down with your right leg, you are going to be extending your knee. Um, and then once, once you extend with your right knee, your left knee is then going to be extending on the left side. But for you to continue that pedaling, your right leg now has to flex the knee. And you also have to flex your hip because your knee has to come up. So start thinking about every movement that you do in your daily life and how you extend and flex certain muscles and uh, certain joints. Now there are certain cases where uh, the opposite muscles, the agonist and antagonist, can contract at the same time. Um, and this, in this scenario, you wouldn't be actually moving. This is called an isometric contraction where you're staying in the same position. So for example, if you were to be doing a bicep curl, right? You have the bicep curls. If you flex them to the point that your arms are at 90 degrees, your elbows are at 90 degrees, and you just hold the weight there, 
um, you're not actually moving, right? You're not, your biceps aren't getting shorter or longer, they're staying the same length, but they are working under tension. So this is isometric. Same thing with your triceps. So your triceps also aid in stabilizing that joint when you're not moving. Um, take for example, if you were to just squat down into a body weight squat and just hold that position for 30 seconds. Um, you're going to be holding a position, which means you're not extending or flexing anything. You're just going to be in an isometric state. Um, so in personal training, there's different concepts. There's a con uh, concentric phase of the muscle contraction. There's an eccentric phase. And then when you're not moving, that's an isometric phase. Okay. So those specific terms are not anything that you have to memorize for the central Florida brain bee, but they are really useful in understanding so that uh, you understand muscles and, and how they affect your skeletal system. So, for example, to use the same scenario that we've been using um, this entire lecture, if you were to do a bicep curl or flex your elbow, uh, your biceps brachia is going to be shortening. Um, and that shortening phase is called the concentric phase. And then when you go back down, when you're doing the negative portion of that repetition, or when you are extending your elbow through the biceps, uh, through a bicep curl, you're going to be elongating your biceps uh, and that's going to be an eccentric contraction okay now if you were to just to hold the, the the weight in front of you at a 90 degree angle um, that's going to be an isometric contraction so those are the kind of the differences that you guys should be familiar with but let's go ahead and move on uh, to the different types of fibers for or the nerve fibers that we're going to be looking at so when it comes to skeletal muscle, we're going to be mostly talking about uh, A-alpha fibers. Those are going to be the most heavily myelinated. Uh, and remember that myelin sheath is going to cover the axons of these neurons, and it's going to help transmit the signal at a much faster rate. So the velocity is going to be much faster. Um, and the reason that's important is because of reflexes. So let's pretend that there's a hot stove, right? And your mom tells you not to put your hand on it, and you're a little kid, right? And so the first thing that happens is you put your hand on it. Uh, because you don't follow the rules, right? And so what happens is immediately, as soon as you touch that super hot surface, you're going to react to it without even thinking. And that's because that signal doesn't even make it to your brain just yet. Uh, it goes through your spinal cord. Um, this is called a reflex arc. Uh, uh, it goes through the, the sensory input and then out through the motor output of your spinal cord, straight back to the nerves that innervate the muscles of your arm and it's going to tell your arm to move or it's going to tell the muscles to contract so that your arm can move. Um, and so those fibers have to be very heavily myelinated because reactions like reflexes have to be incredibly quick. Um, this is super important when it comes to evolution because if we were, the slower we react to a dangerous stimuli, uh, the higher risk you are of not surviving. So the faster you can react to some type of external stimulus that could potentially be dangerous, the more able you are, the more fit you are uh, to potentially survive that scenario. Now here are some of the other nerve fibers. So for example, we have uh, A-alpha, which was the group one that has to do with the skeletal muscles. Then we have the A-beta, which have to do with the mechanoreceptors of skin. So mechanoreceptors has to do with uh, mechanical tension. A-delta fibers are going to have to do with pain and temperature. And then C-fibers are going to be temperature, pain, and itching. Uh, and so as you have less myelin, the slower the transmitted signal is. Um, so the more myelin you have, the faster the signal. Um, another really important concept is uh, for anesthesia. So if you're administering anesthesia, um, you're going to it's you're going to have to use more anesthesia to numb the nerves that are heavily more myelinated. Whereas the nerves that are not as myelinated are going to be more susceptible to anesthesia. Okay. Now a thought question for you guys is talk amongst each other and tell me which cell uh, in the peripheral nervous system is going to myelinate the axons. Um, so go ahead and take some time and, and come up with an answer. And then after that, which cell uh, myelinates the axons in the central nervous system? Uh, and then the next question after that would be, how are they different? Um, what is the difference between that first cell you mentioned and then that second cell you mentioned? I'll give you guys a couple times to couple seconds to discuss. If you'd like to pause the video, you could do so right now. All right, so hopefully you answered uh, Schwann cells for the peripheral nervous system and oligodendrocytes for the central nervous system. And the difference between the two is that a Schwann cell can only myelinate a single axon. 
uh, for one neuron, uh, whereas oligodendrocytes can myelinate many, um, so up to tens and dozens. Okay, so moving on, so skeletal muscle, uh, each is made up of, of thousands of little muscle fibers, um, they make up these fascicles, uh, and they're controlled by a single uh, alpha, alpha motor neuron. Um, so this alpha motor neuron is going to originate somewhere in the spinal cord or even the brain, um, and each of these alpha motor neurons can then control a bunch of the fibers, so from as little as a couple of fibers to uh, hundreds of, fi of muscle fibers. Um, so a, a motor neuron plus the muscles that it innervates are going to be called uh, what's called a functional motor unit. Now a question for you guys is, what neurodegenerative disease is characterized by the loss of these motor neurons? Um, and what are the major symptoms of losing these motor neurons? So go ahead and start discussing and then come up with as many answers as you can. Um, think about what the best answer would be and then the, the mechanism behind what's going on. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes. So if you had ALS in mind, you had the right idea. Um, so ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, it was also called Lou Gehrig's disease because a famous baseball player had this disease um, and kind of brought it to light. Okay, um, This ALS is a disease of motor neurons. Uh, MND is another name that it goes by, which literally means motor neuron disease. Um, and the major symptoms uh, is going to do with muscular control. So a person with ALS will slowly lose their ability to use um, their muscles. So this usually starts off in the extremities, like the hands, uh, the feet, uh, then the arm, the leg, and then eventually all the way down to the torso. Um, and this can leave a person wheelchair bound. So if you guys remember Stephen Hawking, who passed away recently, he had ALS, um, and he actually outlived the, the general uh, expected life expectancy. So most people with ALS are only expected to live uh, two to five years. But Stephen Hawking kind of expanded it to about um, 10 years, 10 to 12 years. I don't remember exactly how much, but he definitely surpassed the mean life expectancy for someone with ALS. Um, another really important thing to talk about uh, ALS is how it compares to other neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and because it's only a motor neuron disease, it's not going to affect any cognitive ability. So a person's ability to think, a person's ability to create art or to solve problems is not... Uh, touched even their personality isn't uh, touched. It's only motor neuron. So ALS is only motor neuron and it's not really going to affect anything else. Now as of this date, um, so it's October 13th, 2019 for me, um, we still haven't found a cure or a specific cause to what ALS is. In fact, 90% of the cases are what we call sporadic cases where only 10% of the cases are familial. So that means that there's some Gen, uh, genetic component to the familial cases, but the sporadic cases, uh, we're not really 100% sure the cause, the root cause of it. Um, right now, leading research says that there might be multiple factors, multiple environmental factors, so that could include uh, the diet, that it could include toxins in the environment, um, oxidative damage to certain parts of uh, the DNA in these motor neurons, uh, maybe alcohol, uh, and just genetic susceptibility to this disease, but as for right now, about 90% of the cases, we actually do not know um, how they originate. So, um, something to think about. This is why we need more people in neuroscience to, to research and study, because we obviously need a lot more answers than we have, especially for ALS. Okay? So, moving on from ALS, uh, we're going to talk about the reflex arc. Okay? So, reflexes. So, like I mentioned before, uh, reflexes, they don't really... Uh, pass all the way up to the brain just because that extra distance requires more time and the more time you take to react to something that's potentially dangerous or life-threatening the less likely you are to survive so uh, a reflex arc will really only go to the spinal cord so what happens um, is once you get a sensory stimulus from your hand your feet or whatever uh, whatever or wherever the stimulus is um, that signal will be arriving to your central nervous system so we call that an afferent signal or afferent signal and it's going to go to your spinal cord uh, through the dorsal aspect um, it's going to be processed through the dorsal root ganglion and the gray matter of that spinal cord and then a signal an efferent signal which means to exit or to leave 
uh, the spinal cord, is going to go out through uh, the spinal cord and then to the peripheral nerves that are going to innervate the muscles of that region. And it's going to tell those muscles to contract or to relax. Um, and that's what causes a reflex arc. So basically, in, in short, uh, you have an external stimulus. It goes through your nerves to your spinal cord. So it goes from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. Then it gets processed in the central nervous system. And again, that just means the spinal cord. Um, and then it gets uh, a new message gets sent out. So a message gets sent out through an efferent signal um, through the ventral aspect of the spinal cord. And that's going to go to nerves that, uh, that innervate specific muscles. So if you look at the picture uh, above, I'm looking at the top half of the entire picture. Um, what this is is the patellar tendon and the knee jerk reflex. So I'm sure everyone's been to the doctor at some point and the physician uses a little mallet or a little hammer to test the reflexes of your knee. Uh, and the physician does this to, to see a couple things. So there's, there's three scenarios here. Either you're normal and you're healthy, so you have a normal uh, response of your leg extension. Um, that's one. Two, you can have an exaggerated response, so you you uh, potentially kick the physician in the face too hard, and that would be really bad, because not only uh, would you kick the doctor, but uh, potentially that means that there's some something wrong with your central nervous system and, and your brain. Um, and then there's a uh, hyporeflexia, which means a lack of reflex, and that means that you're not reflexing as much as you should, um, which can say that there's something wrong with the nerves that... Um, that are innervating those muscles. Um, in this case, it'd be the quadriceps. So that could be a sign of early ALS or something like that. Um, that could be a sign of some type of injury to that nerve or demyelinating disease like Guillain-Barre, for example. Okay, so the way that we used, uh, the little acronym that we used to memorize the ventral aspect and the dorsal aspect, whether it's afferent, efferent, or sensory motor, is just VEMDAS, V-E-M-D-A-S. Um, some like to use sad mev. Um, I don't like that because it's a little depressing. So uh, vemdas sounds like pemdas for math. So I thought it was really easy to remember. So vem uh, is for ventral efferent motor. So ventral, remember, just means front. Uh, so the ventral is just the anterior part of the spinal cord. That's going to carry a signal that's going out. So efferent, uh, I like to think of the e as exit. So efferent exit, uh, and that's going to be a motor signal. So that's vem and vemdas. Then we have DAS, dorsal afferent sensory. So dorsal is going to be the posterior side or the back side of the spinal cord. An afferent signal, I like to use the, the, the first letter A as arriving. So I think of it as some stimulus coming from the outside and it's arriving to our central nervous system, arriving to the processing center of our nervous system. Uh, and that's going to be sensory information. Okay, so that's VEMDAS. So if you look at the bottom picture, so the bottom half of this picture, um, this picture is showing a, ref a normal reflex of someone, say, st stepping on a pin or stepping on a Lego piece, which we all know how bad that is. So if you step on a Lego piece, uh, you're, you're going to feel it instantly and you're going to want to move your leg out of the way. And so what happens is uh, that sensory information from your foot goes all the way up through your leg to your spinal cord, gets processed, and then a signal gets sent out to uh, relax your quads and to flex your knee. So just like you're looking at the picture below, you see that the quadriceps or the, the muscles on the, the superior or the anterior part of the leg um, that are going to help extend your knee are relaxed so that you could flex your knee. And then the muscles in the back part of your leg, those are your hamstrings, those are gonna be active to flex your knee. Now another thing that's not really shown in this picture is that you're gonna move your leg upwards, right? You're going to uh, bring your knee up uh, and the, the action of bringing your knee up is hip flexion. So you're flexing your hip. And this is really important because that uses not only a muscle in your quadriceps, the rectus femoris partially, uh, but it uses a whole bunch of other muscles, uh, specifically the iliopsoas. So the iliopsoas is a muscle that's going to help uh, flex your hip. And that's the action that you're seeing here. So you're going to get flexion of the hip, which means you're bringing your knee up and then you're going to get flexion of the knee, which is going to kind of bend your knee. Um, okay, so that's going to be using your iliopsoas and your hamstrings to do that action. And all that happens in an instant. That happens in a couple of milliseconds. So as soon as you step on a Lego, it doesn't really take you much longer to realize that you're stepping on a Lego and, it, and you just move your leg instantly. Same thing with the stove. If you have a hot surface, 
uh, and you put your hand on it, you're gonna it's gonna take you almost no time to uh, to understand that it's super hot and just move your hand out of the way. So that's a reflex. Uh, so this is gonna be really important to understand. So don't forget vemdas, what it means and how it works, um, and understand that if there is a hyperreflexia, so you have more of a reflex, then you're gonna have uh, what's called an upper motor neuron lesion. So some something's gonna be wrong with your central nervous system in the uh, in your cortex in your brain. And if you have a lack of reflexes, that's gonna mean that you have uh, some type of problem in your peripheral nervous system or the lower motor neuron aspects of uh, your nervous system. And that could be uh, because of ALS or uh, it could be because of Guillain-Barre or it could be because of uh, some type of traumatic injury or autoimmune aspect, which Guillain-Barre would be an autoimmune uh, disease. Okay, really important to understand that these reflexes are not voluntary, they are involuntary. So you don't really get a choice, it's just a reaction that your nervous system has. Um, so that's why physicians will test for it, okay? Uh, and even the simplest of reflexes involves the synchronous activation and inactivation of multiple uh, motor units. So that means that a reflex is not only going to talk to one set of muscles, it's going to talk to um, or send signals to multiple muscles to relax and then others to contract and vice versa. So it's a full reaction of, of a huge set of muscles. Because, for example, if you go back to that picture of... Uh, you stepping on a Lego or somebody stepping on a pin or a Lego not only are the hamstrings being flexed but you also have the hips you also have potentially the ankle and you also have the opposite leg okay so notice that you have the opposite leg if you bring your knee up on one side if you uh, do the action which is hip flexion so to bring your knee up you're only gonna be on one leg which means that your your opposite leg is gonna be fully responsible for holding up your body and for that to happen, you're going to have to maintain an erect leg, which means that your quadriceps on the opposite side are going to have to be contracted. Your glutes are also going to have to be contracted on the other side. Uh, and that's in order for you to be stable on one leg. So one reflex stimulus uh, or one stimulus causing a reflex um, doesn't matter where the stimulus is. It could be on the left side or the right side it's going to cause a reaction that is bilateral, which means on both sides. It's going to cause two different reactions. So it's gonna cause a, a, a reaction on one side that is different from the reaction on the other so that you can get out of that dangerous stimu stimulus. So get it, move away from that dangerous stimulus. And that's really important, especially when you're talking about evolutionary neuroscience. Okay, so that's that reflex arc is beautiful. So, um, yeah, and those reflexes are really there to protect you from getting uh, continuously hurt. Um, so they're there to protect you from injury. Okay. Now there's different types of muscles in the body. So there are skeletal muscles, which are basically the muscles that help you move. They're the muscles that uh, affect your skeletal system, hence the name skeletal muscle. There's also cardiac muscle. Um, cardiac muscle is going to have to do with the heart. The muscle fibers are actually set up a little bit different there, the, the individual cells. Um, but nevertheless, they do the same thing. They contract and shorten to um, do some type of function, in this case, pump blood. And then you also have smooth muscle. So smooth muscle is going to line things like your intestines. Um, they're going to do the action of peristalsis, which is to move the bolus or move the food that you've just digested through your digestive system. Um, and not all the muscles are gonna act on joints. So that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. So the skeletal muscles are going to act on specific joints. So for example, we talked about the biceps brachii, we talked about the quadriceps, uh, and we talked about the hamstrings. Those are all uh, messing around with joints. But the cardiac muscle obviously has to do with the heart. Cardiac is, means heart, so in reference to the heart. And then smooth muscle, uh, think of the digestive system for that one. I think that's the easiest example, okay? Now, muscles themselves have um, different organs. So we have the Golgi tendon organs and the gamma motor neurons. Um, so these are located where the muscle fibers connect to the tendon. And that's going to be really important because uh, under a lot of load or under a lot of tension, or let's say that you end up jumping away from something and uh, you have to stand on one leg or jump to one leg or jump to one side, your body is constantly getting sensory input from your muscles. Uh, this is important for one proprioception, but for two, so that you don't overstretch or over tear your muscles. Um, so muscle tearing is a natural process. So if your muscles are being broken down, you're getting micro tears. That's that's actually good. 
Um, that is what drives what we call muscle protein synthesis, or it drives the, the buildup of muscle. Uh, it's how you get stronger and faster and better uh, in the gym or in sports. But there is a limit to that, and you have to take it slow. So for example, not everybody can just stand up and then touch their toes. Um, it, it takes a little bit of training and a little bit of flexibility to uh, eventually be able to touch your toes. And so we have these Golgi tendon organs in, the, uh, in our muscles where the muscle fibers connect to the tendon to help our, our nervous system uh, interpret the stretching of the muscles, to tell us where we are, how we are, uh, and how much of that we can take. Now you can actually train yourself to get more flexible. Uh, flexibility is actually not really for the muscles, it's more about a neuromuscular thing. It's all about your brain. Your brain is what's holding you back. It's, it's scared of injury. It's trying to prevent injury. Um, so you have to actively stretch uh, to get used to the stimulus of being in a stretched position and that's what makes you more flexible. Okay, so uh, these, these golden tendon organs are going to detect the amount of force or, or strain or tension is on the muscles and on the tendon themselves and that's going to be really important to understand uh, how much you're moving and how to correctly move it um, uh, to interpret the motion uh, and to become more precise. Okay, so as all these movements occur, the muscles involved provide feedback to the brain, and that's really important because if you didn't have any feedback, you would never really be able to learn how to do something. So, for example, if you take like a, a basketball, if you've never played basketball a day in your life, but you had Michael Jordan next to you teaching you how to shoot a basketball, the first couple times that you shoot a basketball, it's going to be very awkward. You're not going to be able to, you know, do it as well as the professionals do. Um, so that takes time to learn. Same thing with a bicycle, same thing with playing like an instrument in the piano, you know what I'm saying? So it's exactly the same concept. Uh, your body provides feedback through these, these organs in order for you to learn how to do something correctly. So a huge part of, of these uh, organs is to interpret and give feedback, or excuse me, just to give feedback. And there are specific parts of your cerebellum and cortex that are going to integrate that information, that are going to... Uh, process that information and they're going to distinguish whether that movement was was correct or was incorrect uh, and it's going to compare what your intended movement was versus what the actual movement was and then what you can do to get better and this is how you pr uh, you consistently progress at getting better at anything uh, that has to do with musculature this includes the piano uh, this includes video games that are highly technical uh, in their mechanical uh, uh, requirements um, in basketball, uh, in anything you can think of. So any sport, anything that has to do with muscles. Um, the more you do something, the more efficient you get. So for example, something in personal training is, uh, is the economy of motion. Um, this is true for uh, musicians. It's also true for runners. Um, the idea that the more you do a movement, the more efficient you get at it, which means the less energy you expend and the smoother and faster you can do something. So, for example, someone who is running, whoever runs more is going to become more efficient in their motion of running, and therefore they're going to spend less calories doing so, and they're going to be a lot faster. They're going to be a lot more efficient. Someone playing guitar uh, who's trying to shred a solo is uh, going to have to work a lot on their economy of motion of their fingers, because the more distance their fingers moves to hit a note, the longer it'll take for them to actually hit that note. So the smoother their fingers are, and the faster and more synchronized their fingers are, the better, smoother, and faster they'll play. Um, so that's a concept called economy of motion, and that's thanks to these tendon organs that we have, these Golgi tendon organs uh, and the gamma motor neurons. Okay. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing things correctly because if not, that can lead to injury. And that's what uh, these are helping us to do. They're preventing injury. Now, there is a scientist named uh, Broadman a long time ago. And he basically took the brain and divided it into different sections uh, and numbered them and then basically said that this area, say for example, area number 10, uh, does this specific function or it has uh, a lot to do with that specific function. Um, so Broadman areas are, are very important in clinical neuroanatomy. They're really important in things like uh, uh, in anything clinically based. So in neurosurgery, in neurology. Uh, what we want to pay attention to right now are the area four, 
uh, area six, and then even three, one, and two, because we talked about the somatosensory cortex, um, or you're about to hear about the somatosensory cortex, depending on what school is listening right now. Um, but they're both going to be really important. So Rodman area four is going to be your main, your primary motor cortex. Your premotor cortex uh, is going to be Broadman area six. Um, so the Broadman area six in this uh, is the, the light blue. Uh, and that Broadman area four is going to be that that faint yellow. OK, so your premotor cortex is going to help integrate and, and decide like how the motion is going to happen. And then the primary motor cortex is going to tell uh, going to descend down and tell the muscles what to do. OK, now remember that that primary motor cortex is going to be on that pre central gyrus, which is just anterior to that uh, central sulcus. And your primary somatosensory cortex is going to be the post central gyrus. And that's going to be Broadman areas three, one, and two, as depicted in this picture. And that's going to have to do with sensing the touch and feel of, of stuff uh, and textures. Okay? So, uh, remember that Broadman area four is your primary motor cortex, and Broadman area six is your premotor cortex. Now, the regions of the brain that are responsible for motor function. So motor function is actually really, really important. There's, all, there's a yin and yang relationship uh, for motor function. Um, that means that basically either something is contracting or relaxing or there's uh, an increase of one neurotransmitter and a decrease of, of the other or there's, being, there's things being activated and things being inhibited at, all at the same time. When this yin and yang relationship gets affected, you have motor uh, disorders. So you have movement disorders. So I want you guys to discuss between yourselves and uh, think about some movement disorders. Um, what's the best example or the most common example of a movement disorder um, that's not ALS like we talked about before? So think about these regions in, in the brain uh, that uh, affect movement and help integrate movement. And then what's a disease that you know affects these regions? That could be the thalamus, it could be the basal ganglia, it could be the motor cortex. Uh, and things like that. So go ahead and discuss among yourselves and we'll talk about some examples. So probably the best example for a movement disorder is gonna be Parkinson's. Um, there's also other ones like cerebral palsy, uh, but for now let's look at Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is a disease uh, that's caused by the death of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So the substantia nigra is a, is a little area that's it's a hyperpigmented area in the brainstem. And hyperpigmented just means that it's very, very dark. It's like there's a lot of pigment in the area, so it stands out. And specifically the parsa compacta portion of the substantia nigra, the, those cells die. Uh, and those are the cells that basically synthesize dopamine and allow dopamine to ascend through the basal ganglia. Now, if there's no dopamine, you're going to have way too much acetylcholine in relation to uh, dopamine. And when that happens, you cannot inhibit muscular contraction. And because you can't inhibit the muscular contraction because there's too much acetylcholine, um, you're going to get spastic movements. And so someone with uh, Parkinson's is going to exhibit tremors. Okay, so that's kind of a really important concept to get to understand. Uh, Parkinson's is characterized by tremors. So something that you can memorize for Parkinson's, because we are going to continue talking about this in a future lecture, is the acronym TRAP. T-R-A-P. So T is for tremor. Uh, R is for rigidity. A is for akinesia or bradykinesia, which means just a uh, uh, lack of movement or, or uh, slowed movement, slowed or slurred movement. And then um, P for postural, postural instability, excuse me. So that's trap. So T for tremor, R for rigidity, A for akinesia or bradykinesia, and then P for postural instability. That's how uh, you can kind of diagnose Parkinson's uh, on the fly. Um, so those are, that's what Parkinson's is characterized by. But it's really characterized by the death of the substantia nigra neuron, neurons. That's really important. Now, for example, cerebral palsy, um, there are different types of cerebral palsy, but one of the types is going to be called spastic cerebral palsy. And spastic cerebral palsy uh, it presents itself in a very similar way to Parkinson's, where there's just a lot of 
uh, uncontrolled spastic contractions of the muscles, but they're very mild. There's just a lack of inhibition of muscular contraction. They're not huge wary movements like Korea, as you see in something like Huntington's, but they are spastic and a person will be very shaky, if you will. And so, uh, spastic cerebral palsy uh, can happen because of a lack of blood flow to a part of the brain that uh, uh, the basal ganglia, um, that, and that's going to be from the, the MCA, the middle cerebral artery. So uh, we're not going to have enough time to talk about the vasculature of the brain, but for those of you that want to learn a little bit more in today's lecture, the middle cerebral artery has two huge branches. There's a superior division and an inferior division. And the very first part of that superior division is going to give blood to uh, the striatum or part of the basal ganglia. And if that is occluded or basically there's ischemia, there's lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen, then those neurons are going to die. And if those neurons are no longer functioning, then you're going to exhibit the same as if you didn't have dopamine in the first place. Because in a regular person, in a healthy, normal person, dopamine is going to be created in the substantia nigra. And then that dopamine through the ascending dopaminergic pathways is going to go through the basal ganglia uh, um, through that system. But if there's no dopamine, then you're going to have a lack of inhibition. So they, they present themselves very similarly, but they're completely different diseases um, or different conditions, we'll call them. So that's really important to understand. Now in Huntington's, Huntington's is a little bit different. So Huntington's is uh, purely genetic. Um, so... It happens in both men, men and women uh, equally. It's not uh, sex dependent or anything like that. It's not a sex linked disease, um, but it is genetic. So the difference between Parkinson's and Huntington's is that Huntington's uh, uh, originally will affect uh, the indirect pathway of the striatum. And so what that's going to do is going to lead to the inhibition of uh, striatal neurons. So these interneurons, and that's going to overstimulate the motor cortex and cause something called chorea. Uh, Korea is C-H-O-R-E-A uh, and that's going to be uh, kind of this spastic movement um, in a very similar way to Parkinson's but it's not going to be a tremor it's going to be kind of like a a larger contraction causing a, a, a writhing of, of m movements that are uh, dance like so the word Korea is uh, dance like it comes from uh, from Greek and so the difference there is that actually Huntington's will progress where to the point that the indirect pathway and the direct pathway are affected and then the later stages of Huntington's a person is going to move a lot less so there's going to be a lot less motion um, but in in both cases they're they're both going to cause movement disorders now in the difference between Parkinson's and Huntington's is one the origin of the disease so Huntington's is, is a polyglutamine disease that's uh, genetic so it has to do with a trinucleotide repeat which we'll talk about in a different lecture so uh, don't get too bundled up on that specific point because we'll we'll talk more about it later um, but it is uh, it it's going to progress in a way that's going to also affect the cognition of the person whereas someone with Parkinson's isn't necessarily going to have uh, deficits in cognition, so the ability to think and things like that. Um, although it is a neurodegenerative disease, uh, Parkinson's is mostly for movement, and it's not going to affect cognition much else later on. Um, but Huntington's is going to affect more than just motor pathways. It's going to uh, selectively destroy a lot of different uh, neurons in the brain and the cortex, and it's going to lead to atrophy of the brain um, in many regions. So a person with Huntington's, as they progress through the disease, uh, is going to have uh, motor deficits, spastic movements, eventually uh, uh, lack of movement. They're also going to have uh, memory loss, kind of like in Alzheimer's, but it's going to be uh, also affecting their personality and things like that. So it's going to be a, a much larger uh, disease, if you will, because it encompasses much more of the cortex. Um, but Parkinson's and Huntington's are very, very different. And we'll discuss that when we actually talk about specifically neurodegenerative diseases and uh, their root cause and symptoms. So the cerebellum is probably the best known structure in the brain uh, that is responsible for movement. So very often in psychology classes like AP psychology, I took AP psychology in high school, and we learned that the cerebellum had a lot to do with balance. So cerebellum, bellum, like you're balancing a bell on your head. Um, that's the way I learned it. 
And the cerebellum does help integrate uh, proprioceptive, uh, proprioceptive in information from the vestibular system, for example. Um, but it's not its only job. So it's going to integrate uh, information that you get from the sensory input from the limbs, the head, uh, and other parts of your body, as well as part of the cortex to kind of smooth out every single movement that you do. So this is the difference between uh, having a disease of the cerebellum, like ataxia or a lack of uh, the ability to control your movements, to being able to, to run in a straight line or being able to shoot a basketball really smoothly. So uh, there's a test for the cerebellum and for the basal ganglia, and that is the, the finger to nose test. So uh, a physician would likely stick his finger out uh, about like a foot away from your face, uh, almost 12 inches from your face. And the goal is for you to touch your nose and then touch the physician's finger and then back and forth repeatedly. Um, the physician would move their finger and you would have to kind of look for their finger and, and make sure that you're actually reaching out to the correct location. Now the challenge after that is the physician will stop moving and then tell you to close your eyes. And then if you can still smoothly move your finger from your nose to the physician's finger, then you're in, in, in a good place. But someone who has uh, some type of ataxia is not going to be able to do even the simplest of that. Um, they're going to be very shaky and they're going to have uncontrolled movements. Um, so this is another way that you can have a movement disorder, which would be ataxia. Um, there's truncal ataxia, there's vestibular ataxia, there's uh, Friedrich's ataxia. There's so many different uh, uh, ataxias out there and they all have their own little specific uh, symptoms um, and we just don't have enough time to get into them. But basically the cerebellum is responsible for integrating that sensory input and smoothing out motor function. So really smoothing out uh, the, the coordination. Okay, and it plays a huge role in, in motor learning. So the difference between you shooting a basketball for the first time uh, and then shooting a basketball for the millionth time um, or the difference between you going for a, uh, trying to squat for the first time versus, uh, you know, five years from now, you if you wanted to progress into uh, uh, hundreds of pounds of uh, on a squat. Um, so the cerebellum plays a huge role in that and damage to the cerebellum. Uh, would you would lose your ability to learn as well as uh, your ability to move smoothly through 3d space okay um, basically uh, just like this goes back to the, the 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 Golgi tendon organs as well as the gamma motor neurons and learning so that cerebellum is going to integrate the information it receives from that um, now degeneration or injury of the cerebellum uh, is going to cause a bunch of different symptoms now I want to leave you guys with some questions uh, so that you guys can discuss with yourselves and your teachers. So question number one is going to be, what is an antagonist when we're talking about muscles? Question number two is going to be, what kind of fibers are going to innervate skeletal muscles and why is that important? Question number three is what disease is characterized by the loss of motor neurons? Question number four is what type of information do C fibers carry? What are the C fibers for? Uh, the next question is what are the three types of muscles that we have in our bodies? And I think the last question that I'll leave you guys with is what is the difference between something like Parkinson's and Huntington's and ataxia. What are the similarities, but what are their significant differences? And then I'll even ask, what are the root causes of each individual disease? So what's the cause of Parkinson's? What's the cause of Huntington's? And then what's the cause of something like ataxia? Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Um, keep studying and keep reading. Uh, I recommend reading ahead so that you get ahead of the game because the brain bee is approaching and it'll be here before you even know it. So. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can always email me or Ernesto. Uh, my email is sebastianleon at knights.ucf.edu. So if you have any questions on anything that we discussed today, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and hope you guys have a great rest of your day.